Okay, so uh, yesterday I told you all about uh, single stars, and at the end I warned you that in fact, especially for massive stars, but even for solar type stars, being single is not all that common. They typically, for stars like the Sun, typically binaries. For more massive stars, they're more typically triples, quadruples, uh, sextuples, and so on. <clears throat> Uh, so let's start off talking about what happens when you have binary stars. So the first point to make is that <clears throat> binary stars can start to interact. If I have a star of radius r separated from another star by a semi-major axis a, we'll pretend they're all circular for the moment. Uh, if they're close enough, they circularize through tidal interactions. Um, and if the separation, this ratio A over R, is less than about 20, so the separation is less than 20 times the separation of the larger star, I'll assume its convective layers in the outer part are, uh, it's convective in the outer parts, like for the sun or for red giants. Um, then if A over R is less than about 20, the tides induced by this star on the larger star dissipate energy. If the star is rotating not tidally locked, then those tides, if I was standing on the surface of the star uh, going round, I'd see these tidal bulges going over, so I'd be going up and down all the time. That dissipates energy, and eventually that energy synchronizes the star, so the star is tidally locked to the orbit, just like the moon is tidally locked to the orbit around the Earth. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> the time scale for that synchronization goes, depends as A over R to the 6. It's a tide, so it depends very sensitively on this. But the characteristic time scale is something like months to a year for A over R of 1. So A over R of 20 is the number you get if you want it to circularize in the lifetime of the system, of say 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 9 years, depending on the uh, lifetime and mass of the star. Okay, so tidal synchronization is very common. Then if the separation gets less than some number which depends on the ratio of the masses, for equal masses it's about two and a half, um, then the two stars, rather than each individually being little stars uh, self-gravitating in their own way, um, when the larger star will begin to fill its rush lobe so that the surface of the star will reach the L1 point, where the gravitational force changes sign from pointing towards this star to pointing towards that star in the co-rotating frame, so including the centrifugal distortions. Um, so at that point, the surface of the star at this point feels zero gravity at the L1 point. The material is being pulled equally towards this star and towards that star. Um, <clears throat> then if the star continues to swell up, then of course material begins to fall into the other Roche lobe, I can have stars that are completely filling both Roche lobes if enough material transfers from this one and fills up that lobe. Um, and if it continues to grow, all of this material inside the second Lagrange point is actually still bound to this common system. So I can fill up this sort of peanut or gourd-shaped object with material inside a single envelope which is co-rotating. And it's only if it starts to get out past this L2 point that material gets lost and makes, begins to make a circumbinary disk. Now, all of these pictures that I've drawn here assume that every particle, the only velocity it has is omega times r, cylindrical radius, that everything is co-rotating. If I start to have differential rotation or this, one of the stars or some of the gas is rotating more slowly than the, the orbital angular velocity, then all of these beautiful Roche pictures break. And that's the beginning of sort of the, the more standard picture of common envelope. But <clears throat> uh, filling up this to the second Lagrange point and beginning to lose material happens if you have a fairly low mass envelope where the tides can keep the whole thing rigidly locked. And as recently, more and more people are beginning to sus suspecting that loss through the L2 point may actually be important in nature. Okay, so if I, sorry, yeah? Right. Uh, so this dimensionless the moment of inertia, right? Yeah. So we have different values for the same n. Oh, oh. So sorry. This is n. This was. This one's n equals three. Sorry. That should be n equals three. Yeah. So this is sort of uh, gas-dominated polytrope yeah. and radiation-dominated polytrope. Yeah. Sorry. Good catch. Yeah. <coughs> I was cutting and pasting to avoid typing stuff. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, so 
how do we bring stars initially into Rochlobe contact? Obviously, the typical stars when they're born are not <coughs> in Rochlobe contact. So there are two ways you can do. If you start off with A over R much larger than 1, you can fix that either by reducing A or making R bigger. Okay, so how would you make A <coughs> smaller? Well, you lose angular momentum. You can do that by gravitational radiation. Um, even if I say take a pair of 10 solar mass stars, I need to start them uh, with orbital periods less than two and a half days if I want to merge them in the age of the universe. Then I can just about do that, right? The, that would correspond to a separation of about 19 solar radii, zero age main sequence, 10 solar mass stars, four. So this A over R, they're not quite filling the rush lobe, but they're almost practically doing it if I want gravitational radiation to matter. So typically for main sequence stars, gravitational radiation is not very important at shrinking their separations unless they're already practically touching each other in the beginning. Um, more commonly important, at least for low mass stars, the convective outer envelopes uh, is thought to be magnetic breaking. So you saw that if the star separation is less than about 20 times the semi-major axis, they can be tidally locked. If the star has a wind, and that wind is carrying angular, rotational angular momentum away from the star, the star will begin to slow down, but the tides will keep it locked to the orbit, so the orbit is therefore effectively losing angular momentum, and so the orbits begin to shrink, and that, and that of course depends on the amount of mass loss in the wind and also the magnetic field, which gives a longer lever arm for removing angular momentum from the wind. And it's thought, for example, that the sun has been slowed down by magnetic breaking. And if the sun had been in a binary system, the binary system would have lost a lot of angular momentum. Uh, because rather than just the sun slowing down the 30-day orbital period, the orbit would have kept keeping the sun rapidly rotating. And it would have lost even more angular momentum. Okay, so these are the two ways of losing angular momentum. Uh, again, this one requires you to be close enough to be tidally locked. If you're not, then you just wait till you turn into a red giant and your radius expands, and eventually you'll come into contact with the other star. So, for example, a 10 solar mass star that was only 4 solar radii on the zero age main sequence. There's a famous one, you can go out and see it tonight if it's clear. Betelgeuse, the bright red star in Orion, is a 10 solar mass star that was roughly 1,000 solar radii. It is swelled up by a factor of 250. So if you put Betelgeuse in binary, it would be filling its rush lobe with a semi-major axis of 2600 solar radii, which is 12 astronomical units, sort of out <coughs> uh, <coughs> past Uranus, orbital period, or I guess past Saturn roughly, orbital period of not nine or 10 years. Okay, so that's a huge fraction of binaries that can come into contact. So this is the diagram I showed you before, sort of showing you that uh, you know, a large fraction, like 53% of O stars, have multiple companions, and basically 80% of them are in binary, have at least one companion, only 15% were single. And so if you look at the fraction, what fraction of them have orbital periods where they might come into contact, it's basically everything down here. So we saw that orbital period of 10 years will come into contact for 10 solar mass star. Here's, this is log of orbital period in years, here's 10 years. <clears throat> and you can see that basically uh, that's 80% of the binaries, triples, et cetera, times the fraction that are actually uh, in those systems is about 60% of all of the stars will be in binary systems that will come into contact during their evolution. Okay, so this is not a rare phenomenon that only one in a hundred stars are going to swell up and come into contact. This is 60% of every massive star is going to, this is going to happen to it. Okay, so I thought it was rather nice uh, often to go back to the old papers uh, which first introduced these concepts. So this was, I think the first word time common envelope was actually written down by Bodon Paczynski in the conference in 1975 in Cambridge. Uh, and <clears throat> people had been puzzled. So the great puzzles of binary star evolution is the, the, the Algol paradox, that Algol has a less massive red giant and a more massive main sequence star, and everybody learns that massive stars evolve faster. So how is it possible that the red giant is less massive than its neighbor, the blue star, orbiting it? And the answer is that the red giant used to be more massive before it dumped its material onto the companion. 
Okay, and the second problem was how do you get a white dwarf orbiting something that's way inside a red giant because everybody knows the way you make a white dwarf is by going through a red giant evolution and that takes those would be, not be in contact year orbital periods, and here you see systems with hours to days and cataclysmic variables, for example, the white dwarf orbiting an M star or a K star with an orbital period of hours, and how is that possible? Because that would have been, the other star would have been buried inside the red giant. So people have been worrying about that, and uh, sort of in the early 1970s, there was a flurry of ideas, and this paper, I think, was sort of the sort of really elegant summation of the whole common envelope process. Um, <clears throat> so Bodon says, you know, when the contact binary expands so much the stellar surface moves beyond the outer Lagrange point, the common envelope binary is formed, and he suggests that the two dense nuclei spiral into each other, the envelope expands and is lost, most of the angular momentum is lost with the envelope, and therefore the final orbital period may be much shorter than the initial period. So that's how you make the short period binaries. And he points out this star V471 tau, which had been discovered a few years ago. It's a binary system in the Hyades, the, uh, the constellation Taurus. <coughs> uh, so he proposed that although its current orbital period is about 12 hours, it might have started off with a 10-year orbital period. And <coughs> he then uh, has this nice little statement at the end, observational discovery of a short period binary being the nucleus of a planetary nebula would provide very important support for the evolutionary scenario presented in this paper. Okay, so planetary nebulae are thought to be the very hot young white dwarf inside the ejected envelope of a red giant. So if you saw a binary white dwarf inside an ejected envelope, that would look like the description of this. So here are some planetary nebulae. They're beautiful things. There's ejected gas being ionized by the very hot young white dwarf in the center. Here's NGC 6326. Uh, this star, which is doing the ionization, is actually a hot white dwarf in a binary with an orbital period of 0.37 days. Um, this is Ethos 1. Uh, it's a beautiful planetary nebula with a pair of jets squirting out the side. Uh, binary orbital period of half a day. Uh, here's an NGC 6778, orbital period of 0.15 days. Uh, here's another really pretty one. Uh, <coughs> this is NGC 6337, orbital period of 0.17 days. Uh, so this is a 0.56 solar mass white dwarf from a star roughly like the sun, or a little bit more massive than the sun. The 0.2 solar mass red, red dwarf companion. Uh, the, eight, the white dwarf has only been uncovered for about 20,000 years. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to see the complete list, they're now not just one that Bodon was waiting for. There are 60 of them in this catalog that's maintained by um, <clears throat> David Jones. And you can go look up that URL and find all the pretty pictures and all the data and all the binary <clears throat> planetary nebulae. Um, <clears throat> Now, there's, there's uh, some even more nice work that's been done on these. You'll notice that this one is beautifully round. And there have been careful radial velocity measurements that suggest that this is round not because it's an edge-brightened sphere, but this is actually a face-on disk. This is a donut lying in the plane. Because you see you can do proper motions and measure the velocity. It's expanding much faster this direction than in this direction. <clears throat> okay. Um, whereas, you know, this one sort of looks like it's a jet going out in this direction. This one looks like it, if it was a donut, it would be a more edge-on donut. So people have been done, done very careful measurements of the properties and velocities and proper motions in the planetary nebulae. And they've also been able to measure the orbital plane of the binary in the center by looking at the modulation. So the hot white dwarf is irradiating the companion making a hot side. So if it's edge on, you see a large variation in the brightness as the hot side goes around. But if it were face on, you see a much smaller one. So by measuring the flux and the separation, you can figure out what the amplitude should be and therefore infer the orientation of the binary. And here's the, cor the correlation between the inclination of the binary, hot white dwarf and its companion orbit, versus the, the inclination of the nebula. And you see that when you see nice round disks, it's a face-on binary. And when you see edge-on binaries, they're nebulae that look like that. 
And so the interpretation is that the ejected mass is basically a fat donut. It's not a sphere. So if it was a single star, you might expect the envelope ejection to be roughly spherical. The red giants will be very slowly rotating. But if it's being ejected in a common envelope where you're spiraling in, you're giving the orbital, initial orbital angular momentum to the envelope. So it's a rapidly rotating envelope. So you'd expect it to be much denser in the equatorial directions in the pole. And indeed, that seems to be why you have these butterfly-shaped planetary nebulae that they're expanding donuts, and it's the binary that's ejected them. OK, so uh, as usual, you know, Bodon's paper was about three and a half pages long, and I thought it was actually worth reading a little bit of this. Um, because you know, the first paper on this subject, you read it, he outlines what's easy to do, what's hard to do, and now you look 45 years later, and all the stuff he said was hard is still hard, and all the stuff he said was easy is the standard lore, right? So <clears throat> we really haven't made that much progress. <clears throat> uh, so he starts off, you know, this white dwarf in V471 tau <clears throat> is a young white dwarf, cooling time of 10 to the 7 years. Um, the latest calculation is 1.1 by 10 to the 7 years, okay, so that hasn't changed much. Um, therefore, the parent star had a mass close to the turnoff of about two solar masses. The current best estimate is 2.7 because Hipparchus improved the distance, okay? But, um, <clears throat> so a star of two solar masses went through a double shell burning phase, like I told last time, until the hydrogen shell reaches 0.8 solar masses. The mass of the white dwarf has now been measured as 0.83 solar masses, <coughs> okay? So I said point, should have a core of 0.8. According to the theory of stellar evolution, the radius would expand to about 600 solar radii. Current best estimates with MESA is 650 for the new mass. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at that point, the Roche lobe was filled. This requires an orbital period of about 10 years. Current best estimate, 9.5. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it may be possible to modify the details of the evolution and decrease the orbital period, but I do not think it can be made shorter than a year. I think, like I said, 9.5 is the best estimate. Okay. So as soon as the red star fills its Roche lobe, mass transfer onto the low mass main sequence secondary begins. The mass transfer may, may be very large, quotes an earlier paper, uh, and may last for just a few orbital periods. I'll show you the latest 3D hydro simulations, 10 okay, so orbital periods. <clears throat> it seems very likely that, uh, that under such conditions, the common envelope is formed. The initial phases of this process when the main sequence dwarf is being enveloped by the red giant are difficult to analyze. Notice those words. We still don't know how it starts. Um, <clears throat> it's probable that the two dense objects, the degenerate core of the red supergiant and the main sequence dwarf, will spiral towards each other within a common extended envelope. The process of spiraling in could be crudely analyzed without much difficulty. That's absolutely true. Everybody continues without much difficulty used to use the crude analysis and the other stuff is <clears throat> much harder. Okay, so he then has you know a page talking about the drag on the K star and shrinks the orbit and so on. Um, and then he says as the two nuclei uh, come closer and closer, the orbital angular momentum decreases. It's the square root of the separation. Same is true as the angular momentum. The angular momentum accumulates in the extended envelope. At a certain moment, the angular momentum per unit mass will be so much larger in the envelope than the binary, it will be increasingly difficult to transfer the angular momentum out. So the binary stops spinning up the envelope. And <clears throat> the circumbinary envelope will rotate differentially, and this will decrease the drag. So it will be rotating near the, near the star at the same angular velocity as the star. He said then there's another effect that may decrease the drag. If the drag luminosity becomes comparable to the luminosity of the red giant, so if the orbital energy you're putting in, you're putting in at a rate comparable to what was being carried out in the envelope, you're then increasing the energy of the envelope, and the envelope will begin to expand. So he says the envelope will expand <clears throat> in order to increase the radiating surface. So be a big red fuzzy blob expanding. So that's something to look for in the sky, big fuzzy red blobs expanding. Um, <clears throat> and as a result, the density of matter in the envelope will decrease, and this will decrease the drag force. Nevertheless, it's likely that a certain, so uh, it's far from clear how to take all of these effects into consideration in a model calculation. That remains true. 3D radiation hydro and with turbulence remains difficult, just as it was in 1967, 1976. Um, but nevertheless, it's likely that at a certain phase, the extended envelope will be lost. Unfortunately, it's not possible to predict at this time when the mass loss from the envelope will take place. That remains roughly true, uh, <clears throat> despite our best efforts. 
Okay, so I promised you, and Paczynski promised that there was a, you know, a simple, easy to analyze description. Okay, so here it is. Everything you need to know about common envelopes if you don't care about the details. Um, <clears throat> so let's consider a star of mass mg for the giant and a star of mass little m, the companion that's going to spiral in. Uh, the giant starts off with a radius rg. <coughs> it has an envelope of mass me and a core of mass mc. So mc plus me equals mg, total mass. Um, of course, you might wonder how do you distinguish a core and an envelope and but if there's this steep density gradient and then a tail, it's fairly obvious. But sometimes it can be tricky. Okay, and then we go over here and we say, well, initially, the orbital energy is GMM over 2 times the initial separation, or AI is the initial semi-major axis. At the end of the thing, if the envelope has gone away, I have little m orbiting the core with a separation AF. So that orbital energy is GMM over 2 AF. The difference in those two energies is how much the orbital binding energy has changed between the initial and the final configurations. Okay, so that's how much orbital energy I must have lost. That orbital energy must have gone into heating the envelope. And then I can compare that amount of heat, which has gone in with some efficiency alpha. Some of it might have been radiated or squirted out in a relativistic jet or something, but we'll put in the fudge factor alpha, which you expect to be of order one. And then you can ask, how does this change in the orbital energy times the fraction of it that goes into the envelope efficiently, uh, how does that compare to the binding energy of the envelope? And the binding energy of the envelope is roughly g times the total mass times the mass of the envelope divided by the radius of the giant. And then there's a fudge factor, which you can actually calculate from a proper stellar model that depends on the density profile and how much thermal energy versus uh, gravitational energy there is in the envelope, so what the radiation pressure in the envelope is. So this is, this is not a fudge factor, but a calculable number, but typically it's of order one. Okay, <clears throat> um, so honest people actually calculate lambda, dishonest people just put in lambda equals one. Okay. But if you calculate it honestly for a typical red giant, it's like 1.05. <laughs> Um, but it can vary. I mean, if for high mass stars, for example, it can be substantially different than one. Okay, um, <clears throat> so this seems great. So if you want to do population synthesis, you start initial things. You want to find out whether you, how many merging neutron stars LIGO is going to see. And you just say alpha is one, lambda is one. You start off in initial distribution. You just plug into this to count. You know, you know how big red giants are, you just solve for AF and you say that's the initial distribution and then you figure out how many are merging. Okay, but there's another way you could use this equation. You could look at a bunch of double white dwarf systems or white dwarfs with red giants or well, red dwarfs orbiting them. And you could look up the mass of the white dwarf. You can obs observationally determine the mass of the white dwarf, the mass of the companion, um, <coughs> the you measure the orbital period, so you get the final separation, you know the AF, and you know at least something that if I know the core mass, then from stellar evolution, you know that there's a core mass luminosity relationship and red giants are on the Hayashi track. So if you know the luminosity and the mass, you also get the temperature and therefore the radius. So you, the core mass determines the radius of the red giant, so you know what RG was. And if it started when it was Roche lobe filling, then you know that the initial separation was a few times the radius of the giant. So you know all the numbers in, put into this equation, and you can now see what does alpha need to be. Okay. And you can check, is alpha of order one? Is there a solution to this problem at all? Okay, so there was a nice paper by Nalemans and uh, Chris Tout, who applied this to all the, uh, as of 2005, known close binary systems. And they found that they could find a solution with alpha less than one for all but two of the systems, which for very good reasons probably weren't common formed by common envelope anyway. Uh, so for example, in the double white dwarf systems, they needed alpha times lambda sort of in the range 0.5 to one, white dwarf uh, plus K star. So these are things that will turn into cataclysmic variables when they spiral together in the white the M or K star fills its rush lobe and begins accreting onto the white dwarf. Uh, 
They needed alpha lambda is about 0.5, subdwarf B stars, so those are things that are almost white dwarfs, but not quite. They still have a little uh, burning shell on top of them, uh, or around 0.3. And you notice that none of these needed alpha of 20, right? So that's good, because an alpha of 20 would mean you would need, in order to eject the envelope, you need 20 times the orbital binding energy. And that seems rather unphysical. But all of these numbers are conveniently less than one, so that seems plausible. They're, they're not 0.001, and they're not 10, right? So, okay, so that looks good. Nature is actually seems to be doing something reasonable with this equation. <coughs> um, of course, for most of these systems, we don't actually know the, ma we only know the, <coughs> the mass of the core. That doesn't directly necessarily tell you the mass of the giant because it could have done mass exchange before the beginning of this process. Uh, so <coughs> there's a range of alphas, so they actually, rather than numbers here, they actually have graphs with sort of allowed ranges from Monte Carlo simulations. Um, but there's one particular case, namely Pachinsky's original V471 tau in Hyades, where we actually know from the Hyades turn off and the uh, Hipparchus distances what the mass of the progenitor must have been. We now have very accurate measurements of the mass of the white dwarf, the mass of the K star, the separation. Um, <clears throat> we know that an AGB star of this mass produced a core which is just equal to the mass of the white dwarf, so that actually worked out. The radius, the one thing that Pachinsky said was 600 is 680 now. The lambda is 1.05, separation. And you can now solve for alpha. And for this beautifully constrained, magnificently measured source, alpha is 0.05. Well, that seems, you know, it's, it's less than one. Okay, that's, that's a start, right? It's physically allowed. But that does mean that the amount of orbital energy that I put in was 20 times what I needed to eject the envelope. That seems a little odd in most of the simulations. Once you, you, you eject the envelope, the density goes down and you stop having drag to shrink the system more. So it seems a little surprising that this system ended up with as short an orbital period as it did because it already, long before it got to that orbital period, it would have dumped in enough energy to unbind the envelope. Um, so in fact, uh, Webb Inc., who went through this analysis again very carefully in 2008, proposed that, in fact, this system did not form in this way, but this was actually 2.4 solar mass white dwarfs in a hierarchical triple system. And the way you made, it this, made this 0.84 was by merging the 2.4 solar mass white dwarfs to make the 0.84 solar mass. So this didn't actually undergo common envelope as a result of the evolution of a hierarchical triple. So if you want to save alpha equals one, that's one way to do it, is to make it into a triple system. And that's not unreasonable. I told you there are lots of triple systems in the universe, but it's a warning that for, <coughs> you know, either alpha is not always one, in which case population synthesis is dramatically different. If you applied this alpha everywhere in the universe, we would have vast numbers of merging neutron stars in the universe because everything would spiral into very short orbital periods. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, one thing I'll just point out is there's actually an interesting uh, result. So, currently, something like 15% of all planetary nebulae have binary stars and are known to have binary stars in the center. And <clears throat> that seems rather high if you ask about the fraction of all stars which eject envelopes and make white dwarfs, how many of them should have hedge such short binary periods, that's a rather high fraction. You might have guessed 5% rather than 15 or 20%. Um, but there's an interesting problem that for low mass stars, during the AGB phase, it ejects the envelope for radiation pressure on dust, and then it takes a long time for the star to finish the shell burning and become a hot white dwarf where the photosphere is actually able to ionize the surrounding nebula, and by that time, the un envelope would have dissipated, got to very low density, so it wouldn't look like these beautiful high surface brightness planetary nebulae. But if you have a common envelope, instead of ejecting the envelope over the course of 10 to the 5 years, you eject it in a, over a few years, and you strip the envelope off, and you have a naked white dwarf immediately from the beginning. So if you select for beautiful, easy-to-find, high bright surface brightness planetary nebulae, 
it wouldn't be surprising if they were overrepresented in common envelope systems just because of that selection effect. So that may be why there's such a large fraction that the beautiful, well-studied planetary nebulae tend to have binaries in the center. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let me go to the next sort of historical analysis. So that's the order of magnitude version that you know, any theorist can do on the back of an envelope while preparing for a meeting. Um, the next stage is to do 1D simulations of this. So, <clears throat> okay, so we have the star, we have another star orbiting in it. So we're going to heat the envelope. The envelope will have to start subtracting, obviously expanding. It's very complicated to do that in three dimensions, so let's try a 1D. We'll just sort of average the heating from the orbiting star inside the other one, which is going in a donut. We'll just apply that over spherical shells and pretend that we have a spherical envelope that's sort of slowly rotating. And then you can use your favorite stellar evolution code, which uh, in 1978 when Tal Bodenheimer and Ostreicher did this was whatever Bodenheimer's stellar evolution code was. And today, of course, you can program it yourself in Mesa in a couple of afternoons. Um, <clears throat> so we have uh, a number of problems. So as Paczynski said, there's the easy part, which is when there's the big gas drag, the one star is inside the envelope of the other one, there's a drag, it spirals in quickly. And the two problems are getting the process started and stopping it. And those problems remain the fundamental problems in common envelope evolution. So in these 1D simulations, the starting problem is the following. That I start my companion well outside the envelope. <clears throat> and <clears throat> initially, it's only tidally interacting with the outer parts of the envelope, uh, <clears throat> perturbing it. So <clears throat> the outer parts of the envelope, which have very little mass, are very quickly brought into co-rotation. If I shrink the other star very much, it loses a lot of angular momentum but it's only interacting with a very small mass. So that mass very quickly comes into co-rotation. Once it's in co-rotation, there's no longer any drag force. So there's a problem of getting it started, that if you interact with a little bit of mass, you quickly bring it to rigid rotation, and then it doesn't spiral in anymore. So to solve that problem, well, you know, we've we got to get this calculation done sometime in the next thousand years. So let's just start the companion somewhere well inside the envelope where we don't have this problem of slow bringing it into co-rotation. And well, that, that's great as long as the star is a small perturbation on the envelope. So having a mass of envelope outside you comparable to the mass of the star is not already outside the whole envelope. So okay, well then we'll do a 16 solar mass red giant and a one solar mass companion. And then we can start at a few percent inside the envelope and everything will be great. Um, but clearly, if you want to do that for a one solar mass star with a one solar mass star, one solar mass star, one solar mass inside a half solar mass envelope doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> so the starting problem remains a, a, a real issue, I would say. Um, but anyway, let's, let's do the one solar mass inside a 16 solar mass giant. Um, <clears throat> and I'll mention that the starting problem may actually be such a serious problem that it means that common envelope evolution, as I've described, it doesn't actually happen in these cases. Because the other solution is that it actually does come into co-rotation, and then it's the pictures that I was showing you of the peanut-shaped objects that are filling both Roche lobes, and you're just gradually losing material in a spiral out of L2, rather than dynamically spiraling in one envelope inside the other. So it may be that the starting problem it actually means you're solving the wrong problem, because it doesn't start. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's now uh, ask about the next problem. So, okay, so we put this neutron star or white dwarf inside the envelope of, or main sequence star inside the envelope of the, of the red giant. <clears throat> then you notice that basically by the virial theorem, the orbital velocity is comparable to the sound speed in the envelope. And therefore, the Bondi radius, which is gm over sound speed squared plus the relative velocity squared, is basically by definition of the order of the radius of the orbit, or the size of the giant part of the giant envelope it's in. So <clears throat> as the star, the, the more compact star is orbiting inside the envelope, it's basically capturing to accrete one third of the envelope every time it goes around the envelope. Um, <clears throat> so the accretion rate is something like solar mass per year. So if that were a neutron star, that's roughly 10 to the 8th times the Eddington accretion rate. 
so you immediately recognize that perhaps there is an issue to worry about. But it, let's suppose that it's a main sequence star companion, so we don't worry quite so much about Eddington rate. But a solar mass per year, the thermal time scale of the sun is 10 to the 7 years. So if you create a solar mass per year onto the sun, it can't come into thermal equilibrium. It just, the material heats up and it just makes a giant ball and doesn't have time to cool. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about accretion. You just have two lumps orbiting inside a giant hot ball. If it's a white dwarf, if you start to accrete a solar mass per year, the first little bit that comes onto the white dwarf falls in with a velocity of thousands of kilometers a second, and that clearly gives it energy, which is plenty to escape from the envelope, whose escape velocity might be 30 kilometers a second. Um, but then once again, you're accreting much faster than the thermal time scale, so the whole thing swells up into a giant, giant ball again. Um, <clears throat> the neutron star, as I said, was 10 to the 10 times Eddington, so uh, some people, for example, uh, Gary Brown and Hans Bethe had a whole story where in common envelope, you sent neutron stars into these red giant envelopes, they accreted a solar mass per year for a year, then they turned into black holes. Okay, and that's possible if, because this accretion rate is so high that you can get into the neutrino cooled regime that <coughs> um, Craig Wheeler pointed out and Roger Chevalier. Um, <clears throat> and so that would argue that if that happened, you might become a black hole. On the other hand, the accretion probably isn't quite spherical, so if you make a disk and it's that super Eddington, then the radiation from the disk probably just blows most of the material out and you don't accrete much of anything. Um, <clears throat> so again, that would sort of put you back in this case that you just have a giant ball mostly unbound. The black hole, of course, in the spherical case, it will have to really swallow anything you give it. In the non-spherical case, there's a super Eddington wind probably. So, uh, Tom Bodenheimer and Ostreicher decided, let's just forget all of this. Okay, so they ignore the accretion issue completely. Um, just It's a one solar mass thing with a fixed radius, and we don't worry about how its mass changes or what happens to the other material. So they did two cases. So the first case, they did a 16 solar mass star that they evolved off the main sequence to core helium ignition, so it's just sort of uh, beginning hasn't really swelled up to Betelgeuse size, this has swelled up to 60 uh, solar radii. And <clears throat> they started off their one solar mass neutron star, little point mass, <coughs> uh, with an orbital period of 14 days. It was just outside the, the radius of the red giant, the yellow giant. Um, <clears throat> and so this, the solid line is the initial density profile of the envelope, and the neutron star started off uh, outside here, uh, it's sort of part way through the evolution, the neutron star was here, and it's clearly it's lowered the density of the envelope. So the, this is density of the envelope. The envelope has become less dense. It's expanded due to the input of the orbital energy of the st uh, neutron star spiraling into it. Um, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and this shows when they stopped the calculation, and basically the neutron star has gotten practically into the core of the envelope. And the reason that, hap that happened is that if you look here and you ask where is the core and where are the envelope, well, this is clearly envelope and this is clearly core. But when the neutron star is sort of here or here or here, there's not a very natural starting point. So it keeps losing energy and losing energy and losing energy, in which point it's actually inside the core. And <clears throat> uh, at that point, the mass inside it is such that it's the angular momentum that it's imparted has basically brought it into co-rotation. So there's not actually drag, but <clears throat> in their model, quite reasonably, they assume that the convection, which is continuing, as you'll see, out uh, even farther. So here's the Kippen-Hahn diagram. You can see the star is basically almost fully convective near the end uh, due to the input of heat. So initially, the star had a convective core in a little thin convective envelope, but as the neutron star went in, it put lots and lots of energy into the envelope, and so the envelope responded by, well, that's too much to carry in a radiative equilibrium, so I'll just become convective. And that, if that convection carried angular momentum outwards, then it basically keeps slowing the core down, and the neutron star then just keeps spiraling into the center and makes a Thorne-Zhitkov object, a neutron star in the center of the core with an envelope that's expanding away, unbound. Okay, so that one did not make a close binary system. So they then tried their case two. So they said, well, let's evolve the 16 solar mass star uh, 
until it's shell burning, so it's a red giant now getting almost a Betelgeuse size of 600 solar radii. So to start the thing off outside that, you need an orbital period of a bit more than a year. Um, <clears throat> and here, now you look, so here's the core, there's the envelope, and there's the density difference of a factor of 10 to the 6 between them. So now it's sharper, so as the neutron star comes in, you might hope that it would actually know where to stop, it would eject the envelope. Um, before it would actually gotten too far into the core to, and ended up keeping on going all the way in. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, by the time that the neutron star <coughs> actually spins up the inner envelope to co-rotation and begins to uh, stop spiraling in rapidly, it's already ejected most of the envelope and the local heating has basically made an empty shell around the neutron star so it's not actually feeling much drag at all anymore. And so their calculation, they ended up with a final orbital period of nine hours, and they basically had a neutron star orbiting a three and a half solar mass helium star core. Uh, <clears throat> and now you might ask, is that the final state? Well, of course, then you have to ask what happens to the three and a half solar mass helium star core. And the answer is if they kept, that would keep evolving, it would expand, it would start to transfer onto the neutron star, it would be unstable transfer, and it would spiral into the center again and make another Thorne-Zhitkov object. But if you manage to, to wait a little bit more, then you could explode the three and a half solar mass star as a supernova and maybe you make a double neutron star, except in this case it actually would have made a thorn jitkov object. <coughs> uh, and this one shows that, of course, in that case, the outer envelope it was a red giant when they started, so it was initially, in the early stages, had a convective envelope and it just got a little bit more convective as the neutron star marched its way in over a time scale of about 20 years. Okay, uh, so as I said, there's a, you know, there was a starting problem, there's also a stopping problem. <coughs> and so <coughs> the one problem is if, the on, if there's not a very sheep, uh, steep uh, change in the slope between the core and the envelope, then the, star, the companion star doesn't really know where to stop and it just keeps on making a thorne zhitkov object in the end, or if it's a main sequence star, it will just merge and supply hydrogen to the inner core. Um, if you merge a hydro, if you bring a he hydrogen star rather than a neutron star into a helium burning core, that can make a really quite exciting explosive event. Right? You suddenly have added hydrogen into this very hot helium burning region and you get a rather spectacular explosion, which um, <coughs> even Ova and company have pointed out would be interesting to look for. Um, <coughs> and the other thing that can happen, as I mentioned, is that even if you get bored after doing 20 years worth of simulations, that the star can keep evolving for the next 10 to the 5 years, and that subsequent evolution can actually uh, be quite important and may make more thorn jitkov objects. Okay, um, <coughs> so that was the 1D sort of vintage 1978, or what you, know, you can do with a research project for yourself in a weekend with MESA. Uh, you can reproduce Tom Bodenheimer and Ostriker, <coughs> a little bit of work. It's, it's fun. I encourage you all to try it. Um, <coughs> or you know, if you uh, have a really big computer, you can try the 3D radiation hydro version of it. Of course, you know, it's really expensive, so you can't really do the starting problem very well. And you can't, it's pretty expensive to keep running for very long, so you can't do the stopping very well. And you're fudging whatever the point mass is, so you can't do the accretion problem. So it's very impressive. They're beautiful pictures, but you may not actually be addressing all of the necessary physics quite yet. But anyway, they're impressive results. Um, so these are from uh, a simulation a few years ago by Tom and, and Ricker that show a compact object. So this is something that's rather similar to the original Tom Bodenheimer and Ostriker setup. Um, <coughs> the star begins to tidally perturb the outer part of the envelope. Uh, you can see it's not precisely spherically symmetric at this point in the beginning of the simulation. Uh, here's the neutron star here. And sort of this is the simulation, which is about the point where Tom Bodenheimer and Ostriker actually started when it's well inside uh, the, the envelope of the companion star. <coughs> uh, and these simulations, initially one could just carry them out for a few orbits, so there were a lot of issues of starting. Now it's actually possible to carry them in so that you actually get a significant change in the radius over the orbit. And I would say here's a, even Ova and Nandez have done similar calculations. Here's sort of a summary of uh, in spirals in various cases. And 
<clears throat> you can see that uh, for this case, these were low, lower mass systems with uh, main sequence stars <clears throat> spiraling in. Um, <clears throat> but the typical orbital periods that they were starting with, these were sort of 10 to 100 days, and you can see that this, most of the spiral in happens over in, in, within just a few orbits. And, <clears throat> and so the sort of this phase is the part which Paczynski said was sort of easy and that you can fudge up. Of course, the, you know, there's a long period of starting as you're interacting weakly with the outer part of the envelope. And then there's the long period after you've ejected the envelope, but there's a little bit of envelope left and a very slow drag and a little bit of uh, subsequent evolution in the companion, which may be being tidally heated and still readjusting on the thermal time scale. So there's a very long time, which typically is not simulated very well afterwards. <coughs> now, it's been realized for a very long time that there's one very important thing which was not typically included in that little analytical formula that I showed you, or in the simulations. And I mentioned that, <clears throat> you know, you, it would seem rather unphysical to have alpha much larger than one, but how about infinity? So infinity actually is allowed, and the reason is that extreme red giant envelopes are actually not bound. Okay, so they are hydrostatic equilibrium, if you set it up, it's perfectly fine, but there is a lower energy configuration, which is that the envelope is ionized. If you expanded it off to infinity and recombined it, you get 13.6 EV for each hydrogen atom and 24 plus 54 for each helium atom, and that's much more energy than the actual gravitational binding energy of the envelope. So if you could somehow get it to start recombining by starting expanding it, there's plenty of energy to just keep blowing the envelope off. It's not actually bound. So if you just have a little trigger, in principle, you don't actually need the orbital energy to eject the envelope. You can just eject the envelope with just starting the perturbation. So that recombination energy. So this is some simulations by Ivanova and Nandez uh, showing that they started, <coughs> started a uh, binary system off. It underwent the usual dynamical plunge. Um, <clears throat> but you notice that it, it went in uh, ejecting only about uh, 0.4 solar masses. And then what happened was the rest of the material was basically once it had unbound the outer part of the envelope, the inner part, which was ionized, expanded to fill the space which had previously been occupied by the material that was lost through the dynamical interactions. It then cooled down, which liberated enough recombination energy to unbind it. And then there was a second wave when the next bunch of material went out to fill the really ev newly evacuated. So they actually, in this stage, got sort of two bursts. There was a dynamical one, the first recombination wave, and a second recombination wave. And the obs observed systems, which some people think are common envelope, actually show signs of internal shocks and multiple ejections, which might actually have something to do with this. So. OK. Um, <clears throat> so. Well, uh, that's all been lots of fun. Um, so the formation of this common envelope is a transient event. It's a star which suddenly got brighter when it, uh, the orbital energy was dumped into its envelope and it began recombining. Um, but many of the products of common envelopes are actually the transient sources that we'll be, we'll be talking about during the rest of the course. Namely, that to make a cataclysmic variable or a nova, those are nice transient sources of their own, you have to get a white dwarf in close contact with the main sequence star, and we think that happened through a common envelope. So basically all cataclysmic in the variables and novae we think formed basically through common envelope evolution. <coughs> uh, there's a good case that at least one, and probably at least half of all type 1a supernovae, if not more, uh, formed from the mergers of two sufficiently massive white dwarfs. Uh, the way you get two white dwarfs in close contact with each other when they obviously once upon a time were red giants is through common envelope evolution. So every time you see one of these, sometimes in its past, it was probably a common envelope. Uh, we now know lots of close binary white dwarfs with orbital periods of 5, 10, 15 minutes on up. Um, 
<clears throat> and those can do interesting things like point 1A supernova, helium ignition on the surface of accreting systems, and all of those are probably formed by common envelope. Soft X-ray transients of black hole with a M star or K star orbiting it with a few hour orbital period and instabilities in the accretion disk that lead to outbursts every 50 or 1,000 years that we'll talk about later. Again, the way you make those is by common envelope evolution. Binary neutron stars, the famous LIGO event of <clears throat> uh, several months ago, probably also formed in a common envelope, low mass X-ray binaries and so on. So basically all of these interesting transients for first had a slow transient of a common envelope in their formation history. So just to illustrate, here's a story for making the, the LIGO double neutron star system. This one just has one common envelope. There are other scenarios that have two, but in this one they did it with an electron capture supernova, so they didn't need to uh, swell up very much. <coughs> uh, so the idea is you start with, uh, say, a nine and an eight solar mass star. The nine solar mass star transfers most of its envelope onto the eight solar mass star, turning it into a 15 solar mass star and leaving behind a couple solar mass helium core. Then <coughs> uh, the new now 15 solar mass star evolves, starts to become a red supergiant. Uh, in <coughs> the orbital period, or the separation, you can see here they started off with sort of 100 uh, solar radii. Uh, <coughs> out here it's got to several thousand, so this is basically sort of Betelgeuse <coughs> size <coughs> uh, star in orbit. But <coughs> then the neutron star spirals in, uh, and the semi-major axis drops from 2,000 to 40 uh, solar radii. <coughs> then uh, you're left with the neutron star orbiting the helium core of this 15 solar mass star, and the helium core uh, has <coughs> uh, forms a neutron star and a supernova, possibly an electron capture supernova that has a low kick velocity so it remains bound, and then you merge the two neutron stars. So without this common envelope stage, the, two, the neutron star and the other star would never have merged in <coughs> billions of Hubble times. So the crucial stage of getting the period short enough to lead to a gravitational merger is through the common envelope. Okay, so how, how often would we expect these common envelopes to happen? So crude estimate, the Milky Way is forming about one and a half solar masses of stars per year. One of those solar masses are boring K stars and brown dwarfs, but you know, half of those stars every year is more than a solar mass, and so it will evolve into a red giant. Half of those are in binaries, of which 20% have mass ratios and separations so that will lead to common envelope evolution and mergers. So the common envelope and stellar merger rate you'd expect in the Milky Way is roughly half, so 0.1 times 50% or roughly one every 20 years in the Milky Way. So Milky Way, like galaxies, the star formation rate <coughs> is about 0.01 per cubic parsec. So this corresponds to about 5 by 10 to the 4 per cubic megaparsec per year. So you remember the supernova rate in the Milky Way is sort of variously estimated as one every 100 or 150 years. So this is about 5 or 10 times more frequent than supernovae. So <coughs> You know, as I'll discuss later, there are certain events which look like they could be common envelope, but some people say, ah, but that could be a special electron capture supernova in a very dusty AGB star. And yes, that probably is true. That could be an explanation for the source, but the rate of this happening is probably 10 times or 100 times the rate of the exotic supernovae. So in any particular case, it's... Yeah, so, so this is the eccentricity. So in this case, they had a, <coughs> um, because it was quite a large mass loss, I mean, th this, the eccentricity basically depends on the mass loss and the kick that you put in here. So the eccentricities were basically nearly zero until this final stage and they had a 0.96, but the 0.96 is quite model dependent because it depends on, if it was a completely spherical explosion, I think this one you lose four solar masses out of six, so this would actually, if, if this five solar mass star had a spherical supernova explosion, leaving a 1.4 solar mass remnant, it would actually unbind the system. So they obviously put in a kick to keep it bound, and 
the direction of that. You could have any eccentricity you want, essentially, out of that. So. <coughs> yeah, so, so for this, you sort of have to do Monte Carlo with assumptions of covering a range of masses and a range of kick velocities to decide how many double neutron stars you end up making. So that's why I was, the population synthesis in the forward direction has always seemed a little bit dubious because there, you know, there, <coughs> there's an alpha parameter that you put in here, and then there's kick velocities that you put in here. That <coughs> you do your best, but there's always at least factors of 10 or 100 uncertainty. And okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> but once you start measuring them, then you know the answer. And we sort of knew the answer from pulsars beforehand. Okay, so uh, the merger rate is about <coughs> a little less than 10 to the minus 3 per cubic megaparsec per year. The local universe has several times the density of the mean universe, so this is the mean universe. So <coughs> the actual event rate is something like 10 per year within 10 megaparsecs, so closer than Virgo. So if you, if you look at the 100 bright galaxies using spirits or something like that, you look at them regularly enough, you should be catching of order 10 of these every year if you were monitoring all the nearby galaxies. So these are not spectacularly rare events, even quite nearby. So what would we expect these things to actually look like? <coughs> uh, so the typical velocity you might expect for you know, ejecting a red giant envelope would be, say, 30 kilometers a second. So that corresponds to a kinetic energy of something like 10 to the 46 ergs per solar mass of ejected stuff. Uh, you can ask about the recombination energy, and of course, as I emphasized, that was a few times larger. So if you do even just the first ionization of helium, uh, that's about 3 10 to the 46 ergs per solar mass that you have available in the, in the recombination. Um, <coughs> so if you stick that energy in, you start off and you just do the usual supernova calculation. So I say usual supernova, but I think you'll have to wait till next week to hear the details of the usual supernova calculation. But you start a ball of hot gas at some radius. You start expanding it. You have to wait till the photons are able to diffuse out. And in the meantime, it's been adiabatically cooling. So <clears throat> the larger the initial radius, the larger the final luminosity because you didn't have to exp adiabatically expand it so far before the photons started to leak out. The higher the opacity, the fainter it is, because the higher the opacity, the bigger you have to get it until the photons start le leaking out. <coughs> um, but <coughs> the obvious trend is the luminosity, of course, is nearly linearly proportional to the initial energy you put in. Uh, it, it's much larger if you start with a big star rather than a small one. <coughs> uh, so if you start with a small star, say you in-spiral two main sequence stars rather than a red giant, you can see that you'll get a much lower luminosity. If I started with a red supergiant of 1,000 solar radii, you can see that you get several million solar luminosities out. So the big red giants with the common envelope that I was describing before will have luminosities of millions of solar luminosities, whereas the small main sequence mergers will be more like 10 to the 4. And you can then work out how once you've figured out how big the thing has to be for the photons to start leaking out, that sets the characteristic time scale for the event. Um, <coughs> and <coughs> that depends rather weakly on almost everything except the mass that you eject. So for 0.03 solar masses, it's a few weeks. If you eject a whole solar mass, it's a few months time scale. So these are not fast radio bursts of millisecond time scales. And you don't have to have a cadence of every night to find them because these things last for weeks to, to months. OK. Um, <clears throat> so this diagram shows a bunch of labeled objects, which I'll mention in a little bit. The, the very first one that got recognized was an optical transient in M85 that my colleague Sri Kulkarni and his group uh, studied in detail and was sort of the first thing that was actually proposed to be one of these luminous red novae that might be from a, a common envelope type merger. <coughs> uh, so this shows the characteristic time uh, duration of the event and the luminosity. So each transient has a sort of characteristic uh, time duration and a characteristic peak luminosity. And underneath that there is a grid of solar model of, of models <coughs> and basically as I said, the models depend on how much mass is ejected, and they've done this. This is not 100 solar masses ejected. This is a 100 solar mass star that ejects a hundredth of its mass. 
so the blue labels are the radius of the star, the mass of the star, and assuming it's ejected a hundredth of the mass, and the red curves are the same thing, but assuming you eject 90%. Okay, so the 90% is more relevant for the common envelope that I've described, where you spiral a star in and you eject the whole envelope. The hundredth of the solar mass is maybe more relevant if I have two main sequence stars which spiral together and they merge before they've actually, so you, that's basically the case where you don't have enough energy to eject the envelope. You spiral in, but the stars merge before you put in enough energy to eject the envelope, and then you just eject the outer parts of the star. So this is sort of an extreme 1% of the mass. So V1309 SCO, the famous source that I'll talk about in more detail later, probably was one of these systems that was a main sequence merger that just ejected a few percent of the total mass. And you can see that that sort of makes sense starting with a couple of solar masses and a few solar radii. And in that case, we actually know that it was a few solar masses and a couple of solar radii because we saw the stars before they merged. In all of these other cases, we didn't see the stars before they merged, so it's sort of a guess, right? So you can choose which, cur which one of these patches or other ones with point 0.1 that you could draw in order to identify the progenitor of the source. <coughs> so an obvious task for the future is that, you know, as, <coughs> as one gets better and more frequent observations of the uh, progenitors to these systems, and we get lucky and find nearby ones that have been studied in great detail, um, one can try to constrain the progenitor and use that to figure out the initial state more precisely. Um, <clears throat> I'll just mention that it's rather fun that you can do this also if you have a hot Jupiter that expands into an expand that spirals into an expanding star. It can eject a little bit of the envelope, and so there's interesting possibility that some of these events might be the, the ends of the lives of planets as opposed to stars spiraling in. Okay, um, <clears throat> so we saw that the predictions are that we'd see things evolving, sort of peaking over months and then trailing off over years. The velocities that you might expect to see are sort of 30 to 100 solar masses and red giants, maybe going up to 1,000 in the main sequence star mergers. <coughs> uh, the very first one of these was this transient at M85. There are very nice limits uh, by people in this room, I think. Uh, Iran and others. Uh, the progenitor was uh, fainter than about absolute magnitude minus 6, but the peak was minus 13, so this clearly was a, a huge outburst of increasing in brightness by a factor of several hundred. Um, <clears throat> there is another one where there's a fairly uh, good constraint on the progenitor that it increased by a factor of at least about 50 in brightness and in the PTF 10 FQS. Um, <clears throat> uh, if you want a complete list of everything in beautiful data, Nadja, where's Nadja hiding here? Nadja will tell you all about it. She's the, the expert on luminous red novae. Um, <clears throat> uh, this was a particular nice one, the M101 optical transient. <clears throat> uh, and I'll highlight the V1309 SCO in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so this trend that I mentioned uh, of the energy, <coughs> well, if we go back here, um, <clears throat> this trend that the luminosity roughly goes linearly in the energy. So you might imagine that if I typically eject some fraction of the solar mass, that this will go like the square of the velocity, and therefore the luminosity would also go roughly like velocity squared of the ejecta. You might expect some sort of correlation of the peak luminosity with the velocity of the expansion, and Yes, there is a sort of correlation of the peak luminosity with the expansion velocity. <coughs> uh, here are some uh, light curves for, for the particularly famous early luminous red novae. Uh, again, so this is time and days. So you see the sort of typical durations in the optical are, you know, a, of order a month to a few months. Uh, the precipitous drop, for example, in this M85 optical transient, this is the, op the visible band light curve. And the visible band light curve, so I think, uh, I guess G is the purple. Um, so the purple has really dropped catastrophically. If you look in the I band, sort of the redder band is dropping. But if you look in the infrared at two microns, you see that it's just a very, very slow decline. So the, the drop in the optical is not because the source is suddenly fading, it's just because the source is getting cooler. 
and it's not emitting optical photons anymore, but it's still emitting plenty of infrared. <coughs> so if you're patient, you can find these things on a much longer time scale than even on sort of months to years in the infrared, because these last for a really long time in the infrared. Okay, so let me uh, end with a little bit about V1309 SCO. So this was really a wonderful, miraculous source. So this was a binary star. <clears throat> so these two stars were almost filling the Roche lobe. So they're very heavily distorted. So as they orbit, the surface area that you see projected varies, and therefore the brightness of the star varies, because each star is sort of an elongated blob, ellipsoidal blob, so you see this large ellipsoidal modulation. And, uh, and the uh, Ogle observers noticed that from between 2002, 2003, 2004, the period of this system was period of these oscillations was changing rather remarkably. So this shows the period which is evolving from 1.44 days to 1.3 days to 1.43 days to 1.42 days. So you know, it's not so often that you see a period change by 1% over a few years. So they got, uh, this is a remarkable thing. Then over that same time scale, as the period was getting shorter, the source was getting brighter, but you know, not dramatically brighter, just you know, from 17th magnitude to 16th magnitude over several years. So that's interesting, as the period's getting shorter, the source is getting brighter, but then it got brighter by a factor of several thousand. <coughs> and then it decayed over, <coughs> over the subsequent year. Um, so the, me the modeling and s some spectroscopy of the source before the merger <coughs> indicate that this was basically a one and a half solar mass subgiant, a few solar radii, with a tiny little 0.16 uh, solar mass, probably red giant, uh, red dwarf star. And with those parameters, you find that the Roche lobe overflow would happen at 1.4 day orbital period. That's when this little 0.16 solar mass star uh, would come into contact with the Roche lobe of this giant. So you know, obviously somewhere around here it hit 1.4 days and Roche lobe overflow happened. And here is a simulation of the, there's the red subgiant of three and a half solar radii with a little 0.2 solar mass star coming in. And as it, at this point, it's starting to fill its Roche lobe, to pull material off the giant. <coughs> uh, the, of course, it can't absorb the amount of radiation. It's getting a significant fraction of its mass in a few orbits. So this just makes a hot blob of gas. And after a little while, the two stars are or just orbiting inside one big hot blob of gas. And in this case, the, this star is only 0.2 solar masses, so as it spirals in, it doesn't actually liberate enough energy to unbind this whole star. It's a, this was a one and a half solar mass star. But <coughs> it did liberate enough energy in these initial phases to unbind, as you can see, this blue area here. It's unbound some of the outer envelope of the star. So that was a few hundredths of a solar mass that got unbound, while the rest of the envelope just, sw uh, the rest of the, um, this giant star just swelled up a bit, but wasn't actually unbound. So <coughs> that was the origin in these uh, plots here of considering this source as maybe something where a hundredth of, this, of the star was ejected, <coughs> but at fairly high speed because the escape velocity from the, from the giant star was several hundred kilometers a second. Okay, uh, <coughs> so that's some examples of what these things might look like. As I mentioned, there are alternative models that have been proposed for individual ones, like electron capture supernovae, sort of not liberating much energy inside a dusty envelope, or uh, instability and in wave-driven <coughs> mass loss inside very dusty mass-losing stars, like Eta Carina's famous outburst and things. So there's lots of ways of basically burying faint supernovae and making them look like luminous red transients, then I would say, you know, in any individual case, you, you can consider these as models, but statistically you should remember that mergers are happening once every 20 years in supernovae, especially rare kinds of supernovae are happening less than once every hundred, so 
if you see a high rate of some kind of objects, then most of them are probably actually the mergers. Okay, questions? Most of the inferred. The, the radii were kind of subgiant radii, right? You expect a lot more to happen after Star Trek a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I, let's see where the. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, I would say so. Th these objects. So it, there's again, there's sort of a question that it, it depends how much mass. So if you interpret them on this blue grid. Then, you know, you want to get these luminosities, you want to start them off at sort of 30 solar radii, so those are you know, respectable giants, they're not extreme supergiants. But it's definitely true that, you know, if you interpret it as uh, the common envelope of the sort I showed where a neutron star rejects most of the envelope of a 16 solar mass star, then, yeah, these are, these are under-luminous, dramatically under-luminous, and in this simple picture it would only be about a <coughs> you need, in order to keep the luminosities that low, you need to have them start off at fairly small radii. Um, you know, the, there is, so the, I would say one, there's probably a selection effect is that if you go over here and you ask what would you expect if I had, say, something like that simulation that I showed with, say, a 10 solar mass of envelope ejected from several hundred so, <coughs> uh, solar radii, it's not specially bright, right? It's just five, ten to the five solar luminosities, and the whole thing lasts for a few years. So I think, I don't know how we have an expert here, how patient are people being if you had something that rose up for a year and then declined slowly over ten years, <coughs> would we be, and they were five, ten to the five solar luminosities, would we be very sensitive to those at the moment? I mean, spirits is now so you're so, so you're maybe, starting to be able to get them. But there's also like long <coughs> period variables. Yeah, there's a lot of at those luminosities in those periods. I think there's a lot of junk to sort out. I think is the short answer. So, yeah. So so I think there's my guess is to be done with the proper simulation and worrying about all the LBVs and micro variables and everything else. We probably haven't really explored this side of the diagram. But you're absolutely right that the progenitors of the things we care about should be living in this side of the diagram. Yeah? How would you be able to discriminate between you know, how much mass they want to Well, I would say, so, so that, that's where the, so if all the information you have is, the, is just something about the transient, it's actually pretty hard. If you wait way into the nebular phase, for example, and you get an estimate of the ejected mass, that might give you a strong hint as to which one of these grids you should be on. But to say something about the radius, for the initial radius, for example, that's where if we're lucky and we get them in nearby galaxies where there was a deep Hubble image beforehand, then you can say that the progenitor must have been <coughs> smaller and fainter than some number. Then you say, okay, it can't have been on this side of the grid because otherwise I would have seen it. Or, oh, yes, there was a red supergiant right there, so it clearly was this one. Right, so I think it's really the progenitors that are the future. So these sources at <coughs> distant galaxies are probably much less interesting than the nearby ones where you can actually have a hope of constraining the progenitor pretty well. Yeah? So what's the maximum luminosity difference you can get this? Um, <coughs> I, so, you know, if you do, sub, say, 10 solar masses, ejection, uh, at <clears throat> and you include the recombination energy, you might get this sort of pushing 10 to the 48. So that would be, um, you know, starting at small, it's a million solar, <coughs> solar luminosities, but if you start at big at 1,000 solar luminosities, you can get up to 10 to the 8. So, you, uh, you know, th there, these would, uh, in terms of total energy output, I think the sort of the, the common envelope merger of Tom Bodenheimer and Ostriker could have an energy bolometric at total energy output comparable to a super optical supernova. But of course, if you make the radius <coughs> an energy that big again, it's coming out typically, uh, let's see, so I guess the big factor here, you might get a factor of 10. So it would be over six months. 
sort of time to rise would be like six months or something. So the total energy would be comparable to a supernova. The luminosity may be kind of a faint supernova, but the whole thing would last for years and, and be much cooler. Yeah? Uh, there was a dip in the light though, of the logo. Uh, yeah, so I think, so understanding <coughs> uh, the bumps and the wiggles is where all that recombinate the successive, so the, the, oh. Sorry, in the successive waves of recombination, is that what you're asking? No, I meant that you observed the figure uh, of uh, the bed channel. Oh, oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah, this one, the <coughs> dip just before the... Yeah, the dip just before. Um, yeah, I can't remember. Nadja, do you remember? Was there an explanation for the dip just before the merger? Yeah. As, as I remember, I think the you know f the the models for the bolometric luminosity. I mean, I think this is the uh, <coughs> Peha and Metzger model. I think they there wasn't any strong prediction of a dip, so um, dust might <coughs> might be plausible. It's, I mean, it's rather small there, so it's probably is maybe the the very early phases. <coughs> you know, that that sort of corresponds to some phase like this and. Maybe there's a little dust around that region. But, yeah, yeah the, it's the, the bigger effort has sort of gone into, let's say, there, you know, there's in like the V838 MON, there's lots of, in some of the other sources, there's lots of beautiful spectroscopy and multi-wavelength that indicates that actually the bolometric luminosity has multiple bumps, and so there clearly is. It's not just a single homologously expanding envelope. There actually are successive waves of stuff coming out which are interacting with each other. Again, Nadja can <coughs> give you many details. <laughs> yeah? So um, how do these mergers look different from what you would expect to see from, say, when you form a point bit cross here? Oh, I, would, uh, I think the, so, I think almost nothing would be different about wh whether you actually end up making a close binary in the center or a thorn jitkov object. <clears throat> I think the, pr the principal difference is if afterwards <clears throat> you have a very hot helium star <clears throat> with an expanding envelope, <clears throat> then it probably made a close binary. But if you have an extreme red supergiant with weird abundances in an expanding envelope, then it probably made a thorn Zhitkov object. So I think, it, but as far as the actual supernova, you're just ejecting, I mean, the, the, the luminous red nova, you're just ejecting an envelope. But it's after the envelope that's cleared away. If you've, if there's, <clears throat> oh, you don't have a continuing energy source other than just the compact object, then it would, <coughs> it would just look like the, the, heli the hot helium star orbited by whatever it spiraled in. Uh, whereas the thorn Zhitkov objects typically swell up to red supergiant sizes from the, from the very extreme temperature gradient in the center. Yep. How many of these thorn Zhitkov objects actually Yeah, so th th uh, th there was so uh, a student of mine, David Vakil, found a couple of beautiful candidates that had unusual, the predicted uh, <coughs> rubidium and so on in them, but they're now S-process ways of making those, so it's somewhat less clear. Then Emily Levesque had this beautiful one in the, I forget, LMC or SMC, which uh, turned out to have a proper motion, which put it 10 kiloparsecs from us rather than 50 kiloparsecs, and it clearly is not a member of the LMC. Um, <clears throat> so it's not a thorn Zhitkov object, but a much lower lumin luminosity object. So every few years there's another exciting candidate, but so far as I'm aware, all the beautiful candidates are either uncertain or clearly not thorn Zhitkov objects. But <clears throat> no, I think the, the actual, you know, the question of the stability and the structure of thorn Zhitkov objects, they, they clearly exist in one-dimensional hydrodynamic I mean, one-dimensional stellar structure codes, whether they exist for 
millions of years in nature, I think, is less clear. Um, but if they did, it's really rather surprising that, I mean, if you calculate these sort of merger rates, there's roughly you know, one in a hundred bright supergiants should be a Thorne-Jitkov object. And we somehow haven't found the P process to prove it. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that for your PhD pro project, though. Um, <clears throat> you probably have gray hair by the time you uh, succeed in that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, let's see, maybe this one is sort of the answer. So, so you can see that, <clears throat> uh, for example, this <clears throat> uh, um, the <clears throat> M85 optical transient. So here's uh, two and a half years after the merger. Um, <clears throat> and the infrared is sort of declined by about a magnitude. And the fact that it's bright in the infrared and faint in the optical indicates there's still plenty of dust that's sort of heavily, heavily shrouded. After a few years, you know, I would guess, you know, I, you, know you can work it out from this equation. You put in, you know, this, this is an opacity of 0.32 centimeters squared per gram. You know, with the dust, you probably want several times several times larger than that. Um, so you can then work out at what point should it become optically thin in the dust. And again, it'll, it'll depend quite a lot on how much mass. So I would say the, one, the best ones to do if you want to do it as a, as a postdoc project or choose the ones where you're pretty confident that it's like a hundredth of a solar mass and not the ones where it's 10 solar masses because those you'll probably be waiting for a hundred years to clear out. But a hundredth of a solar mass you might get to in five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Are there more systems where such an effect is observed before the uh, <clears throat> I think maybe somebody can remind me. I think there is one other system where there are indication that's. <laughs> yeah, the, the date depends, of course, critically on the radius you attach to the star. So the distance is important <laughs> for getting the date right. That's when it fills the rush lobe. Yeah, but <clears throat> I mean that's promising, right? That that was in the Kepler field, which is a small part of the total sky. So if LSST or something were really doing regular monitoring, it might be uh, <clears throat> it might be more. <clears throat> 